Good afternoon, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? So I'm Michael Gorman. I'm standing in for Serpil today. She couldn't be here, so she asked me to stand in and introduce our guest. So first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. Welcome to 2018. Uh, thank you again for your continued support for the WIT programs and uh, what's coming this year. So Serpil has put on another phenomenal uh, presenter for today. Uh, so Kate O'Keefe, who's going to come up and talk. She's the senior director from the Cisco Hyper Innovation Living Labs. And she's going to talk about how they do uh, a phenomenal job of creating multi-party innovation environments and what comes out of that. So on a personal note, I've worked with Kate for a bunch of years now, and, and uh, I'm just always in awe with the, the, the output of the programs that her and her team put together. It's a phenomenal environment that they create for innovation. And two of the major components in innovation really are you know, energy and enthusiasm. And Kate exudes both at a phenomenal degree, as you'll see today. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kate. Thanks, Mark. What a lovely way to get started. Um, so you'll have to, uh, I, uh, forgive me for my, um, my very suspicious accent. Um, <laughs> it's usually a lot softer, but I've just been home and I have it a good authority that no one can understand a word I say. I mean, they understand unless there's a vowel and then there are problems. <laughs> So do bear with me. Um, so my name is Kate. Thank you so much for joining uh, the Women in Technology series today. I'm really excited to talk to you about a, a topic that's very, very uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, in fact, um, my job, my entire job uh, is uh, about multi-party innovation, inclusive innovation, bringing the outside in uh, and um, you know, I have a lot of experience with multi-party innovation. I had twins last year, so I consider that <laughs> multi-party innovation. You might have noticed there's another one on the way. This is not a tumour for those of you who are trying to be politically correct. <laughs> so it's going to be an intense year. And uh, yeah, so I, I believe that, that those skills, those motherhood skills put me in good stead when it comes to failing fast, <laughs> prototyping, learning on the fly, learning as a form of doing, or doing as a form of learning is a, a bit of a catch cry uh, for my team. So um, who on earth am I? Well, as I mentioned, I have a very suspicious accent. I'm Australian. Um, I have been at Cisco for eight years this year. Um, I'm actually a two-time entrepreneur. Uh, I've, uh, I was actually on my second startup in fashion. I was ultimately more or less a fashion designer uh, when Cisco found me, I had stores in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, I was a shoe designer. I had a business called Cinderella Bella. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, so when people hear that, they're like, well, how on earth did you end up at Cisco? That's an excellent question, one that I often ask myself. Um, uh, but, um, you know, at the time, I was also doing a lot of innovation in the water business. And Australia was going through a terrible drought and they needed a lot of entrepreneurial thinking uh, at the time. And, and so, you know, the, the trouble with the water industry is that water is really cheap and um, it's almost impossible to fund water saving projects because water is so cheap. And so what I did when they brought me in to help them, they thought they'd bring in an entrepreneur from another industry to help them solve the, this problem. And so what I did was, I devised a lot of industrial innovation projects that happened to save both water and electricity because electricity is really expensive. So we were, we were saving water and funding it through the saving of electricity. And what we did is we created these precincts, these industrial precincts, so your pollution became my industrial input. And that kind of idea of bringing people in from outside and how we might work better together, how we might work as cohorts, as ecosystems as you like, if you like, in order to achieve a shared goal that might be impossible, that might be you know, a business model that's really difficult to achieve. Um, that, those kind of lessons have been you know, really central to uh, my work here at Cisco. So most of what I do is look at areas of innovation 
where we need entire industries to come together at once in order for Cisco to see the shift that we need to see, in order for us to achieve a, a, you know, a level of growth. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that today. So I think I have a video. I'm not sure if it's working or... That's me. <laughs> That's before. <laughs> Again. Not a bad scene, right? <laughs> I think my slides will pop back up after that. Here we are. So I wanted to take a minute to sort of think about, um, you know, what we learned from that, that movie. You know, what an incredible moment in cinematic history that, you know, women finally got an action movie of their own. And I, I think that, 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 that that message that we got or that young women got from seeing that movie is really important, especially when we think about women in computer science. You know, we, they often say that you know, we really can't be what we can't see. You know, and I noticed that in Oprah's speech at the Golden Globes, did you notice her focus on the young girls out there in the audience today? And so, you know, I'll, I'll get back to this idea of multi-party innovation, but what I wanted to do is just take a moment because of the audience that we have today to look at these numbers. Um, so this was fascinating to me. I saw this graph recently um, and you know, I noticed how much progress women were making uh, in every industry uh, in the early 70s. And then I was fascinated by what happened here in 1983. What was, what on earth happened that year that women in every other field continued to excel and continued to enroll. Uh, and yet this happened to computer science in 1983. Does anyone know what caused this in 1983? Does anyone know what happened in 1983? Sorry, I, I need a microphone for you. It's the media. Or oh, Quinn will yell at me. <laughs> I think it's not. I think it has to do with the media and what we see on TV, as yeah. well as the advent of personal computers. Yes, that is exactly what happened. So. The personal computer was launched here in the late 70s, early 80s, and how it was marketed, how it was marketed to people was overwhelmingly that this is something for boys, that this is something that fathers will do with their sons, and they will play Atari, and they will sell out of Radio Shack. And what happened is that in 1983, the women in those com computer science uh, courses across the country started to hear that they should have had more experience because they, they didn't have enough. Because in marketing PCs to boys, uh, PCs were being brought into homes and placed in boys' bedrooms uh, and placed in, in it, it became the boys' domain. And uh, girls, were, girls were limited in their access 
uh, thanks to those very effective uh, marketing campaigns of the very early 80s. So that's, that, that is exactly what happened. And so I think that there's this interesting thing going on with this moment now uh, in terms of how we remediate this. Because if you think about it, it's like, shit, wow. I mean, if you think about the power that that had about the, you know, the, to drive these appalling numbers uh, of women uh, in technology, especially in leadership, um, the power that the media has on that moment. And so when, I thought that was interesting when we were reflecting on the, you know, the awards the other night, you know, a great night of millionaires giving other millionaires <laughs> trophies. What, how important it was though for us to see um, those women take that stand and, and be heard uh, in that way. So these, these challenges find their way um, uh, in a very real sense. Uh, into uh, the venture capital community, um, which is funny because um, your venture capitalists are, um, you know, a, gr a pretty greedy bunch. I beg your pardon, bull bull. Um, <laughs> and so it seems fascinating that in an environment where we are so frequently told, we are so frequently told that. Um, in the, va the, the valley is um, a, a cash rich but opportunity poor environment, which means that there, are, there is more cash available for investment than there are good quality businesses to invest in, good quality ventures to invest in. And some of these uh, numbers are the most, are the most shocking, uh, that only 2.19% of VC funding went to um, women founded uh, companies in 2016. Um, despite the fact that uh, women founders do tend to be more um, successful, they bring in more revenue, uh, and despite how much of uh, discretionary income uh, is actually controlled by women. To be honest, I believe this is caused by the fact that um, Every, we've probably heard the cliche that every great artist, all they ever do is self-portraits. Um, it's pretty much like the valley. If you, if you look at Silicon Valley, it's full of millennials in hoodies. So they make a lot of great businesses for other millennials in hoodies. Um, and they look for other millennials in hoodies to join them on their quest. Uh, and that's how diversity is really driven out. And that's why women are underserved uh, by, the, by the valley. It's why the aged are underserved uh, by the valley. And I, so I th what I wanted to show was the, the profound effect that a lack of diversity can have on innovation. So first of, first of all, the importance of bringing in diverse perspectives in order to drive disruption. And then second of all, the profound economic impact that a lack of diverse views uh, can have uh, on you know, your success in your growth uh, and innovation. And this is all really important because it's actually why it's so important to look at driving multi-party innovation. It's why it's so important to be inclusive, to bring in not just many different perspectives and or genders and ethnicities, but um, also different companies, different corporations, different skills and different capabilities. Uh, it's that diversity of thought that really helps drive disruption uh, and breakthroughs. So, what is Chill all about? So Cisco Hyper Innovation Living Labs is all about driving rapid innovation across large groups. When we brought this together, we were looking at some of the areas of innovation where Cisco was looking to see the most disruptive. Things like cloud and uh, IoT, and um, even some of the work that we're doing from a security perspective, we really believe needed more of an industry-wide approach. One of the tricky things, though, uh, is that large corporations move slowly uh, and don't innovate easily. So when you think about bringing together five corporations at once to innovate, I mean, that's just plain nuts. So let's have a look at what just plain nuts looks like. At this moment, the kind of innovation that's needed needs to be industry-wide. 
When we work together as an industry, this is how large corporations move faster than the speed of startup. We're here in San Francisco with giants of the industry, looking to drive disruptive and rapid innovation. Who can take care of me? Who can take care of my identity online? These are the questions as we look to secure the digitized supply chain. We're actually co-innovating together. So we have real-time iterative processes. You quickly you know, figure out kind of how your team members work together. You just try to make rapid progress. We are continuously forcing ourselves back to the problem that we're trying to solve. We brought together an incredibly diverse group of artists, of builders, of engineers in order to resolve these prototypes in such a condensed period of time. You have senior decision makers from leading companies in an industry. The formulation of ideas and innovation that comes from that is astounding. We love this innovation and we love seeing these great ideas come to life. These teams start with a blank slate. Within 90 minutes they met their first round of end users and they've been spending round after round of revisions on prototypes. There's a constant flow of the end customers and it's such a radical mindset. First question I got was, do you feel like this is important? And you're a bit torn because I felt like the answer was no. Keep reinventing ourselves, it seems, over uh, every 90 minutes. Seeing the way they're collaborating, seeing the way that they're advancing an idea is something I wish I could bottle up and bring home with me. You're testing your hypotheses on the spot. You're having end users validate those hypotheses. We've really condensed nine to 10 months worth of innovation progress into a two day period. As soon as I walked up on that stage, it all got very real. We're transparency. Our solution is trusted. Introducing FastX. Our solution is Nodi. Investors, I'd like to ask you, who'd like to support this team as they take their next step? Woo! It sounds like JNXZ. Who wants to join John Stewart in the support of this? It's one of the most amazing feelings in the world. Jill is the most significant reaction chamber that's ever been created in Silicon Valley. It is unbelievable, the energy, the intelligence, the excitement, and the output. If you participate in one of these chill sessions, you will be overwhelmed, you will not be disappointed. My question to you is, are you in? So what did you think of that? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if you think about this topic of, of industry-wide innovation, if you think about the particular focus area that we chose there, you know, we were looking at driving innovation across supply chains, securing supply chains. So if you think about the particular companies that joined us as part of that lab, we had Citibank, who provides obviously a massive financial provider, but they also provide the bulk of, of Cisco capital. So they're very intimately involved in Cisco's supply chain because they fund a lot of it. Um, there was DB Schenker, so large global logistics provider competes with DHL and FedEx. Um, one of Cisco's largest outsourced warehousing and logistics providers. So they do a lot of the moving around. Um, we had uh, Intel. So Intel, in addition to being an IoT giant in their own right, um, are a massive, massive player in Cisco's supply chain. Cisco is Intel's biggest customer. Uh, so obviously there's a very close relationship and partnership there. And then of course we had GE. Again, in addition to being a tech giant, IoT giant, digital giant, um, big customer of Cisco's. So, um, we chose all of those companies incredibly carefully. We looked for companies that we thought had the capability to work with us in this way. So we do a lot of work um, on the Chill team to think very deeply about the kinds of customers that we think we can work with. Um, we do a lot to help prove and test that relationship. If they can't sign an intellectual property sharing agreement, Probably a bad sign that we're not going to, we're not, you know, we're not going to get a lot of great outcomes out of the relationship. As an example, um, so if we think, if you think about it, we, we we brought in a lot of different folks that had different perspectives 
on some of the challenges they all faced across supply chains. They all had really different views. You know, Citibank had just been hit by a really big money laundering fine or fine for money laundering uh, on their watch that they believed technology like the blockchain could have you know, protected them from. Um, uh, uh, Intel was, is doing amazing work, really world leading work in tracking the provenance of different parts of their supply chain. So you know, we, we bring all these folks together that have these different views. And what's different between this kind of work and maybe hackathons that might look similar, you know, they're kind of eventy and there's a lot of people, a lot of pizzas and soda and stuff. What's very different is that at Chill Lab, um, the teams are really led by senior leadership. So on one team, um, in, in this lab, we had John Kern, who's our own head of supply chain. Jackie Sturm, who saw, uh, was, is Intel's head of supply chain. We had uh, D.B. Schenker's CIO uh, on, it, on that one team. And we ha had one of the heads of trade finance from Citibank all together um, many would say no one in their right mind would have that many egos, that many senior people on the one team. But one of the joys of that is that um, having so many senior peers together, so it really forces that group to look to the end users for answers. You know, my favorite quote out of that video was the guy, I think he's from AIG, and he's like, I felt like they really wanted me to love it, but I just didn't. And we call that killing your darlings. You know, they, they work on these teams and they fall in love with their ideas. And often, you know, they'll, they'll come into these labs with a preconceived notion. Uh, and so um, letting go of that notion and embracing the feedback, they go through round after round of end user feedback. We have 40 to 60 end users there live in the room. <coughs> Uh, who are looking at, 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 their, at these prototypes uh, and breaking hearts, as, as, it, you know, as is usually the case. Um, and what, what's interesting is um, we, 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 one of the reasons, and a, and a lot of you are, are engineers, or so a lot of you are builders, a lot of you are prototypers by nature. Um, the Chill team is very rigorous about its prototyping process. And we believe that a prototype is really um, purely for the purposes of answering a question, purely for the purposes of putting in front of an end user as quick as possible. So there's usually about 90 minutes from um, the time where the team are left alone and from when the team meet their next end user, which means they need to decide what to do, uh, brief the engineering team and get a prototype ready to put back in front of the end users by the time the end users arrive uh, in about 90 minutes time. So it's incredibly rigorous. And one of the reasons it's important that um, they keep up that pace uh, is A, it helps them you know, abandon um, you know, soapboxing and making big speeches. Um, the phrase, shut up and build it. You know, I start saying that by the end of it, I can hear everyone else shouting that at everybody else, which is fantastic. And the, but the beauty of that is that we, we, we make sure all of those end user conversations are prototype driven. Uh, and that's really, really critical because especially when you're dealing with a really senior audience, they're really used to soapboxing. They're really used to having an opportunity to pitch. They're really used to you know, talking people into stuff. And they're, they tend to be very good at that. Uh, and so um, forcing them to, to give a prototype to an end user and then shut up and listen um, it is, is a, an amazing way to get a completely different level of feedback than they're used to. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one of the biggest challenges of my team. Justin, who's over here in the blue shirt, plug for Justin because we'll be, for those of you who are interested in being part of this process, there actually is an avenue for builders and prototypers if you'd like to be a part of it. We have a build team. Um, you can hear it's tough very tough work. Um, but um, the, the, um, the, the process of, of um, forcing an end user, just giving them and being silent, 
If they can't use it, if they don't know why it's valuable, that's good data. Don't tell them why it's valuable. You know, that's really, really crucial data. So that process, that process of round after round of end user feedback is, is really why we're able to move so fast. Because at the end of the second day, you saw in the video, those teams make those pitches. Those teams pitch their final idea to an even more senior group. And you saw Chuck and uh, David Geckler and John Stewart and others and Dave Ward uh, and customer senior executives. We had some board members, we had some customer CEOs. Um, it gives them the confidence that it's worthwhile continuing, continuing to explore uh, these opportunities. And the fact that they've been through so much end user testing is what allows them to have that confidence. Um, the, the, the fact that, I mean, one of the rules we have around labs is that everybody who needs to be part of an innovation decision has to physically be in the room. And so if you like, you know, we've kind of turned the innovation process on its head a little bit. Because what usually happens, and I'm sure all of you have been through this heartbreaking process, you come up with an amazing idea, and then you have to go and shop it around to a lot of stakeholders. And all of them will have an opinion about how you should change it and, and make it suit their team a little better. And so by the time you're done, you don't even recognize this thing anymore. You don't even know if you want to pitch it anymore. <laughs> and so the process of bringing everybody together at once all the large corporate partners who would potentially need to be part of it, all the end users who would ultimately live with this product. With the supply chain, I'm not gonna lie, it was a nightmare. I had customs people, I had factory foremen, I had fleet managers that moved stuff. And we had to think really broadly because I never know where they're gonna go uh, when it comes to um, you know, where it comes to in the moment. I, I don't know where they're gonna end up or, and what kind of end users they need to meet. Um, but certainly that getting, getting that prototype in front of an end user immediately uh, was one of the things that's been so crucial to our success. So in the time that's passed out of that lab, um, we, we, we pitched five concepts in that particular living lab. There were five that were pitched on that day. Four received on the spot funding and all four of those continue today. One of them just sort of pivoted uh, but all you know there were four major projects that came out of that. Um, one of them is a startup. It's actually a startup that was uh, born that day. Um, we actually place startup CEO candidates on teams in the moment uh, so on the teams with the corporate leadership, we have uh, CEO candidates who would be well placed to take the concept forward in the event that they that it was appropriate, and that's where they went. And that's actually happened to us um, three times. So out of the last three living labs, we've had startups created. Two of those startups still continue uh, successfully uh, today. So startup creation has been something that we've we've started doing as part of the chill experience. Um, and you know, we don't do that sort of thing lightly. In fact, we'll do pretty much anything else before we'll go through the pain and heartache of actually create, trying to create a startup from scratch. But sometimes we really need to, I guess, turn the venturing model on its head. So rather than startups coming to Cisco all day saying, Mr. Cisco, have I got an idea for you? What if Cisco and Citibank and DB Schenker could go to the startup community and say, you know what, if you would just build us this, if you could just build this, it would be so amazing. We'd be so much better. We could do go to market together. We would fund you. We would help out with Cisco's $2.2 billion venture capital fund connections and, and the like. So we do have that incredible muscle thanks to Hilton's team. Uh, in order to, to, to do that when, when needed. So we have two uh, startups that are currently going through the process of, of uh, their pre-seed uh, funding rounds. We also have a lot of joint projects and they're big, wild projects. A member of Justin's team, Joanna, has just gotten back from uh, Rwanda just before the break where uh, she went to a bunch of mines, um, Tantalum mines, gold mines, a lot of elements I can't actually pronounce. 
um, and sprayed them with nanotags, sprayed them with an isotope uh, so that we could actually track minerals uh, through our supply chain from the mine to the rack. Could we potentially pull conflict minerals out of Cisco's supply chain? Could we take those tags, could we write them to a blockchain in such a way that we could provide perfect provenance uh, from the, the raw generous, genesis of our products to the racks? That's an idea of the kind of size and scale and magnitude of ideas that come through um, Living Labs. And that came from that team with the two heads of supply chain and a CIO. Um, so yeah, so we do those sorts of joint projects. Uh, and one of the ways that we get so many of them done, if for those of you who are thinking about some of the innovations that you're working on, that you're pitching on, or you're trying to progress right now, one of our rules of thumb is to make the next step of your project cheaper to execute than to investigate whether or not people should give you funding for the next level of your project. So make it cheaper and easier to... Um, to take the next step than it is to take the time to do a lengthy cost-benefit analysis and all those sorts of pieces. The reason for that is a most cost-benefit analysis are pretty useless because they, they include so many assumptions uh, that the, you, the, any question of reality behind what you're saying, like what's the size of the market? I don't know, it's a napkin right now. It's not a market, it's a napkin. Um, <laughs> So this whole idea of, of doing as a form of learning, chunk down your projects into small, easy, achievable uh, questions. You know, your prototype just needs to answer a question. You know, some of the temptations that we have within Cisco is we think a prototype is just something that has bad documentation and doesn't work that well. That's, that's not it. You know, it's just enough to put it in front of an end user group, get more information, make some improvements, put it back out in front of them. And it's that kind of idea that's allowed us to gather so much momentum and have such a rich uh, portfolio of live innovation projects that we're driving forward. So our next living lab is actually about the future of work. Uh, so we're in the final process of closing the cohort of customers that will be joining us for that conversation. Uh, Verizon will be joining, Boeing will be joining, and JetBlue will be joining. We accidentally took on a very deep aerospace flavor, um, which is good. They're doing amazing, you know, amazing things. And we'll be thinking about some of the questions around what will the workplace of the future look like? And it's funny because we actually believe some of the things that we're doing here in Chill reflect a lot of what the future of work will look like. We believe that in the future, the barriers and the boundaries of organizations will become a lot more porous. Talent will move more freely. And that's going to be essential for us to unlock some of the innovation that we're looking to drive. This idea of innovation done in isolation, innovation done as an island. I'm going to hide away and I'm going to do 90% of the same experiments that you're doing in the same space. And then you're going to duplicate that expense over here. And, you know, I mean, the, at the moment, we're coming to grips with organizations behaving in a less, a less siloed fashion. I think where the thinking will go, is going when we consider the future of work is thinking about industries operating in a less siloed fashion. It's a very different framing of the concept of, 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 of competition. And it's for some of these reasons, for us to achieve some of the disruption that we're looking for, for, some of, for us to achieve the scale of, um, of solutions that we want, you know, in order to um, create the future that we're looking to drive, then some of this more inclusive thinking, some of this multi-party thinking that truly leverages diverse perspectives in terms of the talent, in terms of the gender, in terms of the corporations, even in terms of the industries that we engage with to drive some of these outcomes. Uh, it's going to have to change. It's going to have to be more inclusive and embrace uh, you know, more different perspectives in order for us to be successful, in order for us to see the change that we want to see. So I might pause there uh, and see if there are some questions. On the WebEx. Just 
Um, just a quick comment, Kate. Um, it was uh, what people are really interested in is just how to get involved. So do they contact you directly <clears throat> or to the, your counterpart that you just introduced earlier? Yeah, so Justin, why don't you stand up for just a moment? Doesn't he scrub up nicely? <laughs> I would love to invite anyone who's an engineer and wants to join the build team. Please contact me, and we have some open spots. We'd love to have you come build with us in the lab. <clears throat> All right, you, have, so you have to do it in a funny accent as well, Justin. I can't, don't show I me can't up. pull off the Australian accent, so... My wife has actually forbidden me from trying accents. So. Um, I, I run the build team in Outcomes for Kate, and I would love to have anybody who's an engineer that wants to come build with us uh, join us for a lab in building prototypes. Um, please contact me directly, um, J-U-S-M-U-L-L-E. Um, I report to Kate, so if you look for her on CEC, you'll find me as well. Yeah, please come join us. I'd love to, I'd love to have a more diverse build team. And just engineers or engineers and designers? Oh yeah, um, if you can code, that's, that's awesome, but we have a, we have a diverse group of, of prototypers that do a lot of different things. So um, talk to me about what you're good at and we might be able to find a place for you. Good, but it's a pretty robust environment, right? It's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely true and it is an overnight build. So this is a, this is a challenging, very exciting and rewarding opportunity. Yes, <laughs> rewarding is code for very, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're looking for a question in the room. You went from supply chain yes. to future of work. Yes. What's your process for identifying what the topics are yes. and uh, figuring out what it is? And I want to know what the success stories are, the ones still standing from the first one. Yeah, that is great, what you're doing. That is a great question. Um, so in terms of how we choose the topics, um, I'd love to say that there was a very systematic process. In reality, I get a feeling in my waters, which is Australian for <laughs> gut feeling. And then what happens is I start having conversations with the marketplace. So, um, you know, I start, you know, in speeches like these and others, I start saying, you know, in terms of we're thinking about doing the following labs in the future. So the next living lab is about the future of work, turning every worker into a knowledge worker. It's going to have a very rich kind of co-lab IoT sort of focus. Um, but after that, we're considering looking at um, mobility, the future of mobility transport. Uh, and we're also thinking about doing the future of media. <clears throat> Sounds like Mog's got a got a very clear view that media is where it's at. Um, but um, yeah, so we, we see that. And, and then what we're doing is we're looking for customers that want to come with us. I mean, this is a, this is a, a co-creative process. And so, you know, we're looking for customers who are inspired enough about those topics that they want to join uh, and, and partner with us, with us in that way. Um, in terms of the, the, the different topics, how we went from supply chain, you know, we didn't start off with supply chain. We started off with blockchain um, and I was looking for really rich use cases uh, for to apply that technology and in fact you know the next step which is about you know knowledge worker I think we'll end up building on a lot of that work and even and if we go you know a step further to look at say mobility and vehicles I think you can sort of see the progression of the technology families. You think about blockchain, you think about integrity, you think about provenance. Um, and then, you know, when you think about the future of work, you can, you can build on some of that. Like what does, you know, one of the challenges that we have with say, artificial intelligence is that it means we're counting on our data in a way that we never counted on it before. We're counting on our data to make life and death decisions in the moment. So you wanna be damn sure that that data is immutable. And that's sort of, so you can sort of see how I went from thinking about blockchain technologies to thinking about artificial intelligence technologies and how that might power the future of work. And then if you think about the next step, which might be around vehicles, you know, the whole artificial intelligence, blockchain, data integrity uh, kind of idea, you know, you can sort of see the arc of how I'm thinking about building on those innovations. So um, yeah, does that help answer the question? 
Oh, uh, yeah. So um, we can talk about the startups. That's always a sexy one. So we did a healthcare living lab in September. Um, not the September gone, the September prior. So about 15 months ago. Um, and uh, we came up with the with an idea to leverage Cisco Spark, leverage Cisco Collaborative Technology to support a community of caregivers around a cancer patient. So that living lab was dedicated to um, you know, the topic of transforming the patient experience of cancer care. Um, and um, the, the idea that sprang out of it you know, it's, it's actually worth telling you know, the story of the genesis of the kind of the moment where that idea really solidified. First of all, what was interesting is that the process of recruiting the end users for that living lab taught us a lot about our market that we hadn't fully understood. When we were thinking about transforming the patient experience of cancer care, we were like, well, great, we need a lot of people with cancer. Um, what happened is, of course, when we recruited those cancer patients is that a lot of their caregivers had to join them. A lot of people who are that sick, you know, their caregivers, their mothers, their spouses have to join them on that journey. And so very quickly, our end user group ended up including the caregivers, which hadn't been where we, just because of how we had framed the question, you know, we, we hadn't really thought about that as much uh, in terms of their inclusion. Uh, which was amazing because the whole, the biggest idea that's come out of that lab has been very caregiver focused. Um, anyway, what was interesting is we had all of these fancy people, all of these fancy egos on this team, and they're all arguing about how, um, you know, the problem with healthcare is that, you know, the patient's outcomes and the patient's objectives are always going to be completely different to the insurer's objectives. You know, the patient is, is going to want the best possible care. So as soon as they get a fever, they're going to go straight to the emergency room and the, the insurer is going to want to keep them out of the emergency room. So the whole thing is broken. So everything's busted. Everything's, everything's finished. So, you know, there was a lot of that kind of talk on this team. And in a chill lab, you know, we listen for those sorts of assumptions uh, and we rush in users in front of them. Uh, and that's sort of why they're there in person. And then there was this amazing moment when we had, so we had, so you know, we, we brought in this this uh, this cancer patient to talk to this, and they sort of explained, you know, the business model is broken, and your interest and their interest, you know, you're going to want to go straight to the emergency room. And there was this incredible moment where this cancer patient looked at these fancy executives, and she said, "Oh, sweetie, you don't understand. I would sooner die than ever go back to the emergency room." And just like that, they realized that the interests of some of the different parties were much more aligned than they had thought. And so out of that insight, that team completely pivoted what they were focusing on, what they were doing, uh, and started talking about, well, how can we be, you know, drive a more inclusive care experience? And so the outcome for that particular lab is a startup called MyWays. You can Google it, you know, myways.io is their website. Um, it's... Um, they, they're testing, I think it's this month, Julie, Julie's here from my team, she actually takes care of the MyWays relationship uh, with their CEO. Their CEO was there on that day on a team, so he saw the whole concept starting to build up uh, within users and, and, and all of this corporate support. Cisco and one of the other customers, their community health network, they're a Midwest-based um, um, healthcare insurer and, 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 and hospital network. Um, they've been a, a joint shareholder. They've invested with Cisco. Um, they've got a lot of support from the Spark team. Uh, and um, they're beginning their testing with Cisco users uh, this month. So we'll be actually working with Cisco's cancer support network. Um, and, and, and we hope, Fran hopes, to offer my ways as a Cisco benefit uh, before long. So you'll be able to leverage that product um, not just for cancer, but potentially for other acute um, diagnoses. So that's one of the things that's come out of it. Um, the, there was a startup from our last living lab um, called Hopper. It's a little earlier. Um, it's looking to completely transform how e-commerce is done in a way that we believe can drive counterfeiting of Cisco products uh, out of the marketplace. 
a massive, massive challenge uh, for the industry at the moment, working really closely with Cisco partners. And I think I mentioned another of the ideas, which was about nanotagging. Can we nanotag minerals in such a way that we can track, uh, we can track equipment through our supply chain? And could ultimately we offer that kind of confidence to some of our, our, our customers. So for some of our customers that are, you know, nation states, you know, looking to um, be completely confident that the ASICs chip that they're buying or that the, 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 the equipment that they're buying has perfect integrity uh, and hasn't been tampered with in some way, can we leverage some of this blockchain nanotagging technology in order to give them that level of confidence? So those are three of those examples. Um, another question from Webex, Quinn, or we're good. We're good. Okay. Um, I need to get you a microphone or Quinn will yell at me. Um, so you talked about um, how the number of women in engineering has been going down um, and you has, has Chill been focused on doing anything for improving the number of women engineers or women entrepreneurs? Um, has Chill, well Chill's a pretty small team. Um, I think we're majority women on our team. Um, um, you know, not by any intentional move on our on our part, but the kind of work that we're doing um, has meant you know we've had some really outstanding outstanding candidates in that area. Um, yeah, so I think I think I think more creating capabilities that drive um, that so obviously drive more inclusive me methodologies, uh, I think is where we're likely to see most of those outcomes. Um, my team are actively recruiting um, female founders to take forward some of these startups. So we're really looking hard and we're working with a friend of mine, Bulbul over here, uh, who actually is from Portfolio Partners, uh, a, a, a women focused uh, venture capital firm, which is uh, focused on turning all women into investors. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of driving female empowerment. So we're working with groups like that to help us locate founders who can take some of these opportunities forward. Um, we have found that um, our, um, say the startups that we're creating, when we're creating them from scratch, um, we can create much more diverse founding teams. So you know, the founders of My Ways was an African-American male also hopelessly underrepresented minority within Silicon Valley uh, and, and, and a woman. Um, we have another startup that's, you know, white men, surrounded by a couple of white men, but 50-50 um, <laughs> is better than the industry. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're doing our best to, um, to help affect some of that change and some of that transformation. But it is funny that, um, you know, whilst it's not, you know, a driving principle of what we're trying to do, just some of the ways that we go about it allows us to open up some of those opportunities. When we're a little more, um, when we're a little more planful about these things, about recruiting for talent, um, and when we come from an environment like Cisco um, that has so much strong female leadership uh, and has a culture of inclusion, uh, it can be a little easier um, to spot that talent. You know, I'm not a millennial male in a hoodie looking to surround myself with a lot of other millennial males in hoodies. I mean, Justin doesn't even wear a hoodie for God's sake, so. <laughs> Hi, yes. um, so I'm leading a similar effort, but internally very small scale compared to this um, at NHR. And I was wondering um, how much prep do you give to the users and how much prep do you give to the participants and uh, kind of what that <clears throat> process looks like? Um, so you, the, the, the first part of the question was how much prep I give to the end users? Um, well, to the users that you have to validate everything mm -hmm. that are going to be in the room. Yep. So, um, not a ton. Um, it's funny, you know, we used to give them a lot of prep. I mean, most of the prep we give them is, um, don't let yourself be led. You know, you're there to witness you know, whatever it is. And when you found yourself being pitched to and those sorts of pieces um, to resist that, because, you know, we, we brief the facilitators on that, we brief the participants, but people just can't help it. They can't help but put something in front of someone's hands and say, you know, you're gonna love this because it's gonna save you from this challenge. It's like, shut up, 
they may not. <laughs> and often we find that they don't. So um, uh, we do a lot of stuff in the room to make it clear the level of authority we place on those end users. For instance, so we have this little fish tank. So we take out, I mean, we're about to do the same venue again as the one you saw. We take out the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco and it's a huge venue. And so we take out this sort of fish bowl, um, you know, in this space, this big glass kind of area. Um, and every 90 minutes, the end users arrive on the scene. So we have an arena. So in the middle sits the engineers, as they should be, of course. <laughs> Listen to me pandering to my tech-based audience. Engineers in the center, the prototype is in the center, and the teams sort of sit as satellites around that area. Uh, but then every 90 minutes, the end users arrive, and we blast the uh, Star Wars theme when they do that. Da, 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 da. You can see the end users getting their strut on when that happens. They grow about a foot. So they know, you know, we take their views incredibly seriously. Uh, and that's really, really important, as I said, because a lot of them are sort of, you know, frontline type folks, you know, folks that drive forklifts. And you're putting them in front of senior vice presidents and EVPs from all sorts of fa fancy companies, and a lot of them, and you're saying, all right, well, what do you think? And making sure they feel that their, their, their perspective is, is just so key. Um, you know, allows them to do what that guy from AIG said. I felt like they wanted me to love it, and I didn't. Um, best quote from that whole video. <laughs> so yeah, um, making sure that they know they have permission to break hearts and kill people's darlings and um, you know, be contrarian with you know, how they apply it. So we, we, we tend to do less kind of prep prior and do a lot of prep in the moment to make sure you know, they know and they're aware that they're taking that seriously. Other then, questions? Uh, uh, we have a few questions actual, from sorry, Webex. Sorry. Um, what about the actual people that are, like the engineers and the participants and that kind of thing? How much like, do they are part of the prep process or do you do that on site too? Yeah, so um, we do spend a bit more time with them. So the senior executives who are on teams, um, first of all, we interview them at length to place, so we can place them on the right team. We can place them on a team that has that includes a group of people that are likely to invest in the same area. So we do a lot to align interests, um, like that team where I had like all the different heads of supply chain on the one team. Um, a, a great way to make sure that they find a really rich supply chain based concept. Um, so they're interviewed. Um, and then we spend about an hour briefing them. Um, uh, it's invariably inadequate because no matter briefing can prepare them for what it's like to go through an, a 90 minute cycle after 90 minute cycle of thinking, generating, being devastated. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard. And a lot of these people don't spend a lot of time being told that they're wrong or that they, people don't want what they are offering or talking about. So we, we try our best to prepare them for that. Um, one of the biggest things though is that um, we create these teams where everyone's a peer. So nobody can drive the innovation conversation by pulling rank. Nobody can drive the conversation by being louder. Um, so I wouldn't succeed in this environment as an example. Um, and 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 it forces them, because they're all peers, it forces them to look to the end user for answers. Because if they don't look to the end user for answers, they won't get anywhere. And so the facilitators are trained to listen for, that person's you know, making a big speech, they're just trying to talk us all into it. Um, that's a waste of time. We're much, much better grabbing an end user. Even if we have to grab one at a cycle in the moment, does this make any sense? No, then stop talking about it and do something else. Um, so yeah, so a, a, most of the prep, most of the preparation uh, is about setting the right scene in the moment and, and, and letting, letting the process naturally, um, that, that process of, of build and exposure to end users drive the kind of disruptive thinking, tr tr changes in thinking that we're looking to see. 
Hey, Kate, we have a few questions from WebEx. Yep. Um, so what is the relationship between what the Chill team does and the Google Design Sprint? And the what sprint? Google Design Sprint. Um, well, I don't know much about the particulars of the Google Design Sprint in order to say. Um, obviously, a lot of this work is based on some basic design thinking principles. Basic design thinking principles are very much prototype something, put it in front of an end user. Um, um, we find that our process tends to be more rigorous than most design thinking facilitators, for instance, are used to. We're pretty brutal. 90 minute cycles and um, the, the discipline around end user focus tends to be harder than what I can buy from most facilitation vendors. The chill team doesn't do the facilitation, we outsource it. Um, and we, we actually find it hard to find a lot of folks who've got that level of discipline. But in all honesty, um, uh, there's a guy called Tom Chi. If you wanna find him on Google, watch some of his speeches. Uh, he was part of the team that designed the Google, Google Glass. Um, and uh, a lot of that discipline came from Tom, who you know, was, was part of that Google team. Um, not necessarily because um, you know, the Google process was, was so perfect, but because of what he learned being frustrated by people are arguing. And he tells this fantastic story, if you wanna check him out on, on uh, YouTube, he tells a fantastic story about how they chose the script color on Google Glass. They were arguing for weeks and weeks and Sergey got involved and it, 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 it took like 30 seconds of put, actually, so the first uh, prototype of the Google Glass took 45 minutes to build. It would have taken five, except it needed a hair tie and they had no women on the team. If ever there was a case for more gender diversity in an innovation group, that might be it. But um, once, once they built this 45 minute prototype of, you know, they had like, like translucent slides and they literally had like a, an overhead projector over this guy's shoulder and, and he had the, you know, they had the end users, like six of them had the, the slide and the projector on their shoulder for seconds before they said, the script that you've just been arguing about for all of this time is the worst. And every, every cerebral reason you had for it being the best, it uses the least power and it's the easiest on the eye, makes it the most useless because you can't see it. It's not bright enough against the backdrop. And I think that was a, a great example, great story that he tells about why if we just shut up and built this thing, the first time we started talking about it, we would have saved weeks of politics and bullshit and you know Sergey's really fancy so whatever Sergey thinks is pretty much going to happen you know getting away from that and into that shut up and build it you know do do it as a form of learning what's right you know so, so often in a, in a corporate environment we've all seen those powerpoint decks probably drive most of our lives where the third or fourth slide is a list of assumptions about the project and there's 12 or 15 assumptions, most of which are probably wrong. And, and then we're like, well, we listed the assumptions and then we moved on and talked about all the ways we're gonna like build on those assumptions. And it's like, but you're not even sure that, you know, th that any of those assumptions are real. And, and those are some of the pieces that just slow us down and undermine our ability to move and, and, and mean that we go, that's very thoughtful, thank you mean that we, we spend a lot of time spinning our wheels rather than making quick decisions, making really small incremental investments, pivoting and, and trying something new. So, was there another question on WebEx? There are a few, but I think we're almost out of time, so I can collect them and forward them once Great. All right, well look, by all means, you know, reach out to my team um, anytime. Reach out to me. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, as we said, we've, we, we'd love to, uh, for you to join us on our, on our build journey, uh, which is just so critical to our lab process. You can hear how important the build process is to us getting some of these answers. Um, so by all means, find Justin. Um, friend of mine, Bulbul, from uh, Portfolio. If you're thinking about uh, maybe becoming an investor, 
Uh, she has a program that's very accessible for anyone who wants to become an investor and she really believes that one of the best ways for us to change the narrative of women in the valley is to become investors. Uh, and uh, so, so that's portfolio and that's, that's Bulbul over there. Thanks also to my friends from, from Bog uh, and to Serpil. Uh, and um, thanks for taking the time to listen to a crazy fat lady from Australia today. <laughs> so, thank you, Kate. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to uh, talk to us all about children's. Here's a little gift. And, uh, thank you, Michael. We hope to hear more.